mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. Well, good morning. You're going to be opening up your Bibles to Mark chapter 9. We'll be starting there in just a moment in Mark chapter 9. Thank you, Deacon, for reading that for us. Uh, Scotty mentioned in his prayer that the uh, elders have been on uh, an elders retreat the last week and uh, very appreciative of them and uh, that they were able to go and do that and that is a, a big thing for us every year that they're able to do that they do come back and are able uh, because of that week able to provide much uh, direction and guidance for us for the upcoming year I believe the plan is sometime in mid-January for them to present to us some things for the upcoming year and very much looking forward uh, to that. So thankful for our eldership, the way that they love this congregation and uh, seek to uh, do things according to God's will and make sure our congregation is aligned uh, with the will of God for the city of Hartsoul and our uh, communities and, and for your lives. We're going to be here uh, in Mark chapter 9. We've been uh, working our way through the gospel of Mark. This series is called The Good News According uh, to Mark, and we do believe that the words on the page uh, in the Gospels, that those things are good news. They contain the story of Jesus and how uh, Jesus and his story interacts with our lives. Uh, we want to start here in Mark chapter 9, and I want to remind you of, of sort of where we've been. Uh, in Mark chapter 9, we're going to be, uh, our, our passage today starts in verse 38, excuse me, <clears throat> starts in verse 38, uh, but I want to remind you of, of some things that we've previously read. Uh, and back up in, whoop, I went the wrong way. <laughs> back up in uh, Mark chapter 9, starting in verse 33, Jesus is traveling with his 12 apostles. And his 12 apostles, they get into some trouble. You know, with these apostles, their lives are a lot like our lives in that a lot of times it's one step forward two steps back. We see that a lot with the apostles, and we see uh, them do some really good things, and it's a, it's a huge step forward in their faith, and then they say some things, or they act a certain way, and it's a couple steps back in their faith. Uh, and if nothing else, I think we can be encouraged by how the apostles walked with Jesus. Now, I do believe they were always progressing forward, but we see over and over and over again the apostles fail in their understanding. The apostles struggle with what it means to be a Christian. We see that in their lives, and I can take some encouragement in that because I fail often, and I struggle in my walk, and I'm confident that you probably do as well at times too. So I'm encouraged that the 12 people who were physically with Jesus all the time, they also had their own struggles. And they would have a moment to where... Peter makes his, his great confession uh, that he believed Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and Jesus is so excited for Peter in that moment. And in the very next story, Peter says something to Jesus, and Jesus says, Get behind me, Satan. And it was like that constantly for the apostles. And we see that again. The apostles, uh, back in, in, in verse 33 here, uh, and when they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you discussing on the way? But they had kept silent, but they kept silent for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. <clears throat> we looked at this passage two weeks ago, and Jesus is teaching on it where he brought a child uh, and, and set the child in amongst them and, and, uh, and had a teaching with them based off of that child. Uh, we looked at this passage two weeks ago, but what I want us to remember as we go into our text for uh, this morning is that everything that we're about to read, and we're going to read a large portion here. We're going to finish out, yeah, we're going to finish out chapter 9 here in our reading. Um, everything that we are reading in, as we finish out chapter 9 is based off of this conversation. It's based off of Jesus' interaction with the apostles where they had been arguing with one another about their own status and about who is the greatest amongst them as apostles. And this was going to be a continuing conversation. So everything that we read, or we talked about two weeks ago, everything that we're talking about today is all in Jesus' teaching in response to them arguing amongst themselves about who is the greatest. And proof of that is at the end of all of this teaching, in verse 50, at the end of the, the chapter here, Jesus says, basically, he's, after all of this discourse, his last line in this teaching is, and be at peace with one another. 
be at peace with one another. He recognized that they were at contention with one another, that they were competing with one another. And Jesus says, be at peace with one another. And he's speaking the same to us. Jesus wants us to be at peace with one another, to not be people who are competing with each other, who are playing the comparison game, who, who look at other people's faith and how they do things and to judge them uh, based off the things that they are doing or based off the things that they are not doing. It's all about uh, whether they are living in the name of the Lord or not. Uh, so we're going to walk through this teaching here, uh, starting in verse 38 um, in just a moment. But the lesson that we have is be at peace with one another. Be at peace with one another. And I have three points here for us. Be at peace with one another. And our first point is be at peace with one another for all are equal in Christ. For all are equal in Christ. So just to remind you, Jesus had this interaction with his apostles. They were competing with one another. This is also our passage from two weeks ago. And he sat down and called the twelve and he said to them, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them. And taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. So Jesus' response to them competing with one another is saying, you need to be childlike. You need to be childlike. You need to receive each other. Uh, You need to receive children in, in my name, and if you do so, you are receiving me. So Jesus says this to his apostles who are in confrontation, okay? Now I want you to pick up on this. Verse 37 highlighted, whoever receives one such child in my name. So Jesus has this teaching. John responds. John said to him, teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. Now it's important for us to remember, everything that Jesus is talking about is within the context of how Christians are to treat one another, of how the apostles are not an elite status, but that everybody who is bearing the name of Christian, they are all equal in status. So John asked this question, teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name. Remember what Jesus just said? Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. So John says, we saw someone casting out demons in your name. Now there's no no denial. There is a connection here between what Jesus just said when he said, those who receive children in my name, and what John is now saying, were, hey, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. Uh, some that I read this week as I was preparing, uh, they said John asked this question. It, it's, it's commonly believed that John was one of the younger apostles, maybe the youngest apostle. Uh, some people are, are saying uh, in these commentaries that, that this shows John's... Uh, naivety about life he's a bit naive about life and he's even naive about how to communicate with people and chances are you communicate with with people like this sometimes where maybe you are telling a story and the person you're telling the story to they are halfway listening to you and they just take like one thing that you say and then they use that to jump into whatever it is that they want to say you know, so, so some of the commentators are theorizing that Jesus said something about in my name and John, who is halfway listening, uh, decided he was listening in that moment. Said, oh, by the way, Jesus, we saw someone casting out demons in your name. We tried to stop him uh, because he was not with us. That's what some commentators say, that John was only halfway listening. I don't really think that's the case. Now, I could be wrong. We don't know the intentions behind the things that are written. I do think it's more likely that John was one who was particularly struggling with status, who was particularly struggling with how the apostles are greater than other followers of Jesus, and that the apostles should have a certain status and should have a certain level of greatness. I think he was one particularly struggling with this, and in fact, if probably if you just turn your, your Bible over one page, you're going to see that John and his brother James, they go before Jesus and they say, hey, Jesus, we want to ask something in your name. And we ask that on the day that you enter your kingdom that me and my brother will be on your right and on your left. So John really was struggling with this idea of status. And John saw someone, we saw someone casting out demons in your name and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. So John was saying, hey, this person was not part of our group. They were using your name 
And the, and the implication here is, I think the implication is that this person was successfully casting out demons. We tried to stop him because he was not following us. Tried as in we tried and, and couldn't stop him. And to say we did stop him, it says we tried to stop him. So I think the implication is this person was successful. Um, and John, focused on status, is probably thinking, we are the ones. It's us. We're, we're the ones who are supposed to be the ones who are casting out uh, demons. And you're not following us, therefore you should not be able to do this. And Jesus' response, uh, as Deacon read for us, uh, is, is pretty firm. And I think pretty clear. Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, do not stop him, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. So we see here Jesus being firm. For the one who is not against us is for us. For the one who is doing these things in my name uh, will not be able to speak evil against me. Uh, and we, we see this idea that we are to be at peace with one another because we are all equal in Christ. John struggled with this, but, but Jesus was trying to iron this out of him. That we're all equal. Uh, Paul speaks about this. And in fact, we talked about this, uh, I can't remember if it was this past Wednesday or a couple Wednesday nights ago maybe a couple Sunday nights ago, some evening where we've had Bible class, we talked about 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul is writing to the church in Corinth, and they are competing with one another, seemingly, about their spiritual gifts. They are arguing with one another about prophesying and preaching and these other gifts that they have. And Paul is writing to them about how they should view their gifts. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he talks about how the church is a body and how we are all using our gifts together for the glory of the Lord. And we shouldn't be comparing with one another. It's like comparing your eye to your foot. Uh, both are in service to your body and both are equally important to you. Uh, because they are all, collect, all body parts of yours are collectively serving. And he ends that with, as we talked about a couple nights ago, at the end of chapter 12, he says, You should desire the gifts, but still I show you a more excellent way. And then in 1 Corinthians 13, famously the love chapter, uh, Paul opens it up with saying, for if I have uh, the gift of tongues, well, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be able to quote it right. Uh, for if I have, I'm going to have to read it. I, I thought I'd be able to quote it. I'm going to have to look it up. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. For if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all that I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. No doubt, the apostles were very talented men, very skilled men, had a very interesting relationship with the Lord. Were able to do some mighty works and mighty things in the name of the Lord. You take what Jesus is saying, you take what Paul is saying, we have a, a deeper understanding of what it means to serve the Lord and what it means to live with the name of the Lord. We all live under the name of Christ. We all live under the name of Christian. And yes, we do good things. And I'm thankful that we do. But we do good things with the right heart. We do good things because of our love. That's the pure and proper motivation for the things that we do. And while people who maybe are more immature in faith are outsiders who are looking in, might look in and see, well, this person is serving in one way and this person is serving in another way, there must be a difference between them. Those who are seasoned Christians know there is no difference. We're each serving out of an abundance of love that we have. For God and for fellow man. And through this, we are all equal. There is no elevated status. 
we are all equal in Christ because of the love that he has given us and shown us. Every one of us, a sinner. Every one of us, a past. Every one of us, unable to save ourselves and reliant on the saving power of Christ. Everyone a sinner, but everyone redeemed equally. We are all equal in Christ. So we need to be at peace with one another, not comparing with one another, not fighting with one another about who is greater, but understanding that each one of us are all serving in love and are all following in obedience with love. Be at peace with one another, for we are all equal in Christ. Be at peace with one another, for the stakes are high. And in parentheses, and hot. Jesus speaks about hell often. Sometimes we act like Jesus doesn't speak about hell often, but Jesus actually speaks about hell a great deal. And the passage we're about to read is one of his more descriptive uh, commentaries on hell. And as we enter into the passage, probably most of the time, and again, immature Christians are people from the outside looking in. They think when Christians talk about hell, or probably they would think when Jesus talked about hell, that he was really pointing fingers, telling people they were going to hell, that man, he probably went to uh, the thieves and the prostitutes, and he really pointed his finger at it and buried it in their chest and said, hey, because of your evilness, because of these things that you do, you're evil and you're going to hell. And that's not what Jesus did. In fact, just about every time where Jesus talks about hell and where Jesus warns people of them going to hell, it's religious people that he's talking about. And it's how religious people sometimes are blinded to how they should be at peace with one another and how they should treat one another. So when Jesus launches into his, narrative, into his teaching here about hell, he is doing so within the context of they previously have been in contention with one another, comparing themselves to one another, fighting over who is the greatest. And Jesus is pointing to this sort of conversation leads you to hell. This sort of conversation is the, is the kind of conversation that uh, draws in other people, that takes advantage of immature Christians, and that will eventually lead people to hell. So the stakes are high about how we choose to treat one another. And the stakes are high about whether we are at peace with one another or not. Jesus says, Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. Now just hang on for, there for a second. When Jesus says these little ones, um, he could be talking about I think he could be talking about one, or, one of two groups of people. Either way, the, the teaching is the same. He could be talking about when he says little ones, Jesus had previously taught and said, uh, hey, unless you become like one of these little ones, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So when he says little one, he could be talking about how all the children of God are little ones. All Christians are little ones. And hey, if you trip up any Christian, it's really dangerous. He could also be speaking about the man who is casting out demons. And seemingly, the idea is maybe that this person who was casting out demons was either someone who was a newer believer, someone who John definitely perceived as lesser in status, and maybe Jesus was saying, these little ones, these, ones, these, these, who, are newer in Christ, these who are newer in the faith, we need to be especially careful with how we teach and instruct them. Either way, the implication is the same. How we treat one another uh, really matters for our eternal location. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he was thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell, where, worm, where their worm does not die and their fire is not quenched, for everyone will be salted with fire. A 
couple quick things here. And uh, if you're visiting today, you should know uh, I don't speak about hell a lot. But we're going to today because our text brings it out. And what every one of us should know is that hell is a real place. It's easy for us to believe that heaven is a real place. Sometimes it's really difficult for us to believe that hell is a real place. But it is. Our Savior believed it. He taught it. Therefore, we believe it. We teach it. Hell is a real place. There are real souls in hell suffering for their rejection of Jesus Christ. There is a real danger for you if you reject Jesus Christ, if you live out your life without falling under the name of Christian, there is a real danger that you will suffer in eternity uh, in hell. Jesus clearly spoke on that hell was a real place and that people are really going to go there. He does so in graphic detail here. And notice how he contrasts the two. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God the idea of, of the gates being opened up before you and you walking into the kingdom, a place where you are welcomed versus how it is that you enter hell. Enter the kingdom of God. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes than to be thrown into hell. A place where you are casted off into. A place that obviously you do not want to go and you are being forced to be there. A real place. Jesus' radical language here is radical for a reason. Because Jesus is trying to radicalize us. He wants us to understand the reality of this place. And for us to never be people who want to go there. And he wants to radicalize us to understand what it is that gets people there. And ultimately, what it is that gets people there is living lives that are unchristian, is living lives that are unchrist like. You didn't see Jesus enter the world You didn't see Jesus enter the world in order to elevate himself. Jesus didn't enter into the world and say, "I'm the king, treat me like a king." I'm the king, kneel before me, let, my, let me put my feet upon you. I'm the king, you serve me. This is not how Jesus entered the world. Was Jesus the king? Yeah, you bet he was. Is Jesus God? Yes, he is God. Was he God while he was on earth? Yes, he was. And he could have treated people however he wanted to treat people. But Jesus, because he is Jesus, chose to do what to people? Serve them, love them. Have compassion on them. Forgive them. Put their interest above his own interest. Literally every minute that the, that, that the Savior was on uh, this planet, he lived with other people in mind. And when he sees his closest followers being selfish and arguing with one another about status, he makes it very clear. This is dangerous. If you draw other people into this, it's especially dangerous. It would be better for you to drown in the sea. That's how dangerous it is. We need to take very seriously how it is that we treat our brothers and sisters in Christ. That we are people who are all seeking peace with one another because the stakes are high. And quite hot as well. Lastly, we should be at peace with one another, for it's a sign of your redemption. It's a sign of your redemption. Jesus closes out this teaching. So this ends the conversation, what Jesus is saying here. This is, the conversation began with their argument, contention with one another. Jesus brought in the child. Uh, Jesus teaches them about how they should treat people who are uh, teaching, but maybe not necessarily part of their group. Uh, Jesus warns them about how confrontation leads to uh, in, being in danger of, of hellfire. Uh, and one thing I didn't hit on enough, uh, 
is this idea of sacrifice. I should hit on this before we move on. This idea of sacrifice. If your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. Uh, he, he mentioned before, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Jesus is not speaking about actually mutilating yourself. But Jesus is speaking about how all Christians are called to sacrifice. How Christ himself chose to sacrifice. Every moment that he lived was, in essence, a sacrifice of sacrificing his will for uh, the will of God and in service to other people. And we, as, as saying, I am like Christ, I am trying to be like Christ, we are people who do the same thing. We are people who are willing to sacrifice self for the will of God, sacrifice self uh, for the good of our brothers and sisters in Christ. Okay? Uh, so last, last point here is... Uh, be at peace with one another, for it's a sign of your redemption. And he says here in, in 50, Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. There's a lot of complexity through these uh, 20 verses that we've been looking at. And, you know, we... we I don't know how best to explain this. Uh, the first time I did serious travel in my life, uh, was I was overseas for three months studying, uh, studying in, in school. And the people that were instructing us before we went, uh, they said, don't try to do everything. There is always more time for you to go back over there and to do more. And the temptation for me as a preacher is sometimes to go into the complexities of every single passage and not to accept that there's always time to do more. Uh, but as we look at these 20 verses, there's a lot of complexity there, and I hope that you are embracing along with me that there is always time to hash out more of this. And, there's all, and, and there is so much complexity into this passage and to saltiness, and uh, we will get more into that at another time. Uh, the main thing for us to note right now is Jesus is telling the disciples, you want to be salty. You want to be salty. Salt is good and he is equating if you are salty you are righteous all right if you have salt that's a good thing that's a sign of your righteousness uh you've you've heard things like this before because Jesus talks about salt a good bit uh salt in the uh time of Jesus and and even today uh salt was something that both uh purified and preserved especially when it came to to meats you, you rub them down with, with salt. The salt can pull out impurities from the meat. And if you put enough salt on there, it will repel impurities from the meat. And Jesus is saying that as Christians, if you are people who live under my name, you have salt. That through the power of living under my name, that salt, my name, the Spirit of God living inside of you will draw out the impurities from you, and it will help also protect you from the impurities of the world. So Jesus is saying, you need to have this in yourselves. You need to have the salt of my name in yourself to draw out the impurities of your life, to reject the impurities of the world. Uh, you need to have the, the salt of my name in that it will preserve you for eternity. So Jesus is saying, salt is good. Have salt in yourselves. And he is telling you what it looks like to have salt. Part of what it looks like to have salt is to be at peace with one another. We as Christians should have a supernatural ability to get along. Supernatural, as in goes against the laws of nature. We should have a supernatural ability to get along. Our superpower as Christians should be our ability to get along with one another. We are empowered by Christ in this way to be at peace with one another. Uh, his love is a model for us. His Spirit gives us strength to do this. Uh, and Jesus is saying, if you want the salt, what it means is, part of what it means is to be at peace with one another. Um my favorite passage in all the Bible, Romans chapter 12, verse 18. Romans 12 is my favorite chapter in the Bible. Romans 12, 18 is my favorite passage in the Bible. Uh, simple verse, if possible. So uh, far as it depends on you, 
live at peace with all people. Live peaceably with all. A wonderful passage in Scripture. And I believe it is a supernatural ability that we as Christians have, empowered by the Spirit of God. People do not naturally want to get along. But our commitment to Christ, our love for Christ, and Christ working on us should transform us beyond that. Should transform us beyond the natural inclination to divide and to be at war with one another. Transformation should happen to move us past that. Uh, and if it hasn't, that's a serious sign of redemption or a lack of of God's transformative power over your life. doesn't mean we don't have disagreements. doesn't mean we never have contention. It just means that much like the apostles and their commitment to Jesus, that we are always willing to progress, that we are always willing uh, to run to unity, to run to reconciliation, to run to forgiveness and compassion for one another disagreements will pop up uh, but what should always pop up is the love and forgiveness of Christ that should also always pop up for us um, and sometimes sometimes we really need that modeled for us before we can really be people who have adopted it and utilize it sometimes we really need to see that in our brothers and sisters we of course have the wonderful model of jesus christ but sometimes we need the model of brothers or sisters and sometimes we need the model of brothers or sisters doing that to us before we are able to be transformed ourselves uh very faint and I, I, I i'm confident i've used this illustration before uh but i think one of the greatest stories ever written outside of the Bible uh, is the French story Les Miserables uh, written by Victor Hugo and if you're like me you saw the theatrical production first and, uh, and then I saw the movie and then finally I read the book uh, and the book was written in the 1860s uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about it, but it was written 150 years ago. So if you feel like I'm, I'm spoiling it for you, it was written a long time ago. You've had your chances, okay? Uh, I'm only, actually, I'm only, I'm only going to talk about like the, like the, the first little bit, okay? Uh, and, and in this French story, I, I, really, one of, I believe, one of the greatest stories ever told, uh, you have uh, Jean Valjean, uh, who's uh, depicted here, uh, uh, well, he's, he's, he's all over the pictures, but he's, he's, the, he's the main character in the story. And the story begins, he is imprisoned, and he's an awful criminal. And he finally, after years in prison uh, and hard labor, he is released from that. But what he finds is that his, as he enters into the world, that he is a marked man. And that no matter how hard he finds no matter how hard he tries to get work or how hard he tries to provide for himself a living or a place to live, he can't do it because of his past of being a prisoner and a criminal. No one will hire him. Uh, no one will take him in until uh, a church bishop allows him into the church and lets him live uh, amongst the uh, church staff. And he provides food for him, lets him work there, uh, and Jean Valjean, as a criminal, decides this goodness will only last so long. So in the middle of the night, he wakes up, and he steals, he literally steals the silver. He goes and he finds the, uh, the uh, silverware, and he goes and he steals it so he can sell it, provide some money for himself. He steals that. He runs off into the night. He is caught by police. The police bring him back to the church, and while he's there at the church, they throw him down before the bishop, and they say, we found him. Uh, he has your silver. Uh, what, do you want, what kind of punishment should we do to him? Here's your silver back. And the bishop grabs the candlesticks that John Valjean is holding, 
and he says, in your haste, you forgot the most important part. You forgot the silver. And he hands the silver candlesticks to Jean Valjean. And he's telling the police that I gave these things to Jean Valjean. These were a gift that I gave to him. You don't have to arrest him. He didn't steal these things. So he says, in your haste, you left the most important. And he gives them these candlesticks. Now Jean Valjean knew, hey, if I'm thrown in jail for this, I'm in jail for the rest of my life. So it was this immeasurable kindness that propels the rest of the story. That's the first couple chapters of uh, the book or the first couple minutes of the movie. And the bishop's kindness to Jean Valjean completely transforms him into a man where he cares for other people, he looks after other people, he lives this fantastic life of living for other people, all because of the bishop's kindness towards him. And it leads him to say this, And Victor Hugo, and this is the part that I know I've shared before, Victor Hugo writes, To love another person is to see the face of God. Powerful words. Very much reflective of the lessons that Jesus is trying to get across to his apostles and that Jesus is trying to get across to us. To be at peace with one another. Because that is what is at the core of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. To love one another, because that is what is at the core of what it means to be a follower of God. To love another person is to see the face of God. And like I said, sometimes you need to see it in another person before you're able to do it yourselves. And I'm, I'm hopeful. That's what, that's what being part of a church is about. That we collectively are loving the world we collectively are loving one another and collectively are spurring one another on into deeper love for the savior and deeper love for our fellow man uh so jesus ends his teaching and and don't and 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 jesus ends his teaching don't forget the high stakes (laughs) yes we're all equal It's a sign of our redemption. But the bulk of what Jesus is teaching here is about the reality of hell. And it's not, you can read that and you can think this is a scare tactic. And many in the church have used it as a scare tactic. It's not a scare tactic. It's a love tactic. Jesus is telling people in graphic detail here, hey, I love you so much. I don't want this to be your future. So as you read about be at peace with one another, and as we think about the invitation and and bringing ourselves to it, we reflect, are you at peace with other people? Within the context here, Jesus is speaking about being at peace with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Are you at peace with your brothers and sisters in Christ? Do you have love for your brothers and sisters in Christ? Are you quick to run to reconciliation for your brothers and sisters at Christ? Do you seek to live at peace with your brothers and sisters at Christ? I hope you do. If not, there are serious and very high stakes that are on the line for you and for your soul. The good news The wonderful news is that we are not called to live based upon our own love. We are not called to live based upon our own ability to love. We are called to live in obedience to the one who can love through all. We are called to live relying on the one who is able to love all people. And we humbly submit to that. And we accept the power that comes through his love. The power that does give us the ability to love beyond what we can love in and of ourselves. Do you have that power in your life? Have you experienced that wonderful forgiveness and compassion of our Savior? If not, the invitation is for you. And if there's anything that uh, the church can do to help you in your walk with God, we ask you to come as we stand and as we sing. Father, take my life.